also former state GOP chair. Karen, joining us from Spartanburg. How are you doing, my Karen? Favorite, my favorite, too. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. So we figured, um, you know, some news lately um, in the uh, South Carolina world that has extended out to the more national world, uh, more national political scene. Um, talk a little bit about Governor Haley's selection of Tim Scott to replace uh, Jim DeMint. It's a huge, uh, huge uh, opportunity step forward for the state of South Carolina. And of course, you know me, I'm all about history. So um, ostensibly, uh, since the beginning of time, um, only seven individuals that are African-American have actually served in the U.S. Senate. And so uh, Tim Scott will be the seventh, only one woman of those seven. Um, four Republicans, he will be the fourth Republican. Um, and from a kind of a historical perspective from the state of South Carolina, um, we have already shown great diversity in that in Congress, since Reconstruction, of course, Congressman Scott was the first person of color. So he's actually served in a series of breaking through um, ceilings or breaking through thresholds and I think it bodes well for the for the great state of South Carolina. I remember George Will said something along the lines of California had changed the most and South Carolina had changed the most for the best and I think that that really is um, it's really significant and when I made that statement about uh, congressmen of course I'm talking about Republicans because that's where my interest and heart is and um, set aside the fact that there's a diversity issue I think that a congressman soon to be Senator Scott was a perfect choice um, because he has a great reputation he uh, is already on this tremendous trajectory and um, and he is a very true conservative with a great story and he tells that story with humor so um, I think that it's a coup so I mean he, you know, I was at his press conference on Monday and he tried to um I think he tried to brush off, not brush off, but he tried to, I don't think he wanted to make too much about the historical aspects, but he understands that it's more than just filling a seat here. Uh, there's a symbolic, you know, it's, symbolic aspect. That's a common theme. He's always been very, uh, very self-deprecating. He has been self-deprecating, and he has never talked directly, to my knowledge, at least none of the forums, um, when I... Um, when I was fortunate to chair the South Carolina Republican Party, he was running. Um, he actually changed gears. Originally, he was running for um, lieutenant governor and then um, shifted over to Congress and was successful. And he never, in any of maybe a hundred times he was on the stump, never once did I ever hear him talk about um, the color of his skin. It was always the content of his message. And I think that that really is part of what makes him unique and part of what makes him very powerful. So now his uh, promotion, if we want to call, if we want to call, if we want to call it that, uh, he uh, is getting more spotlight, more responsibility, of course. But that means his seat is now open. And last night, uh, we, along with some other people, uh, reported that Governor Mark Sanford will be former Governor Mark Sanford will be joining the the fray there for. Uh, Congressional seat one. So far, I think we have uh, Ted Turner's uh, one of Ted Turner's children, uh, Teddy Turner, and Governor Sanford. Now, Governor Sanford hasn't made it official. We haven't heard from him officially yet, but it seems likely he's going to join. And we have a couple other people: Larry Grooms, um, I think uh, Representative McCoy also looks to be getting involved there. And who knows? So, so give me the first your take on Mark Sanford, and then that whole craziness down there in Congressional one. So uh, the Ports Authority board meeting was Tuesday, and right afterwards I met with my uh, one of my great friends, Lynn Bennett, who is chairman of the Charleston County Republican Party, and um, she said, we were just talking, and I said, how many people do you have right now that have shown interest, and at that point it was 22. Um, so I can tell you whether or not those 22 people actually file, or whether or not those 22 people actually announce. And I told her, she said, um, I said, you know, give me the high names, and she mentioned the ones that you said, and I said, I am crazy about Governor Sanford, but there is not a chance in Hades 
that he would go down this path. And then I read I read Patch <laughs> yesterday, um, and then I received an email from CNN. I think it was Peter Hamby. So I did Patch first, and then CNN. Um, both it said. We so, want to hear. So nothing against say, Peter. Peter's great. <laughs> suffice to say, you know, I just don't know, and. I will tell you just from my tenure um, on the ports and then having traveled again during the time that the gubernatorial race was, I, I my, in my mind's eye, Senator Grooms kind of had the leg up just because he is over transportation, he was instrumental in bringing Boeing, um, he is so involved in the ports. So I've got to tell you, it's a, it's a congressional seat that I am glad I don't live in that area because there are going to be some tough choices, and I think it's going to be tons of fun for you all to follow. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's, it's, I, I wrote a piece, I think it was last week, that said, in South Carolina, expect the unexpected. Well, I will tell you, today, what, what, what I've been seeing kind of pop over the line, it is South Carolina in her best. Well, it's funny. Somebody, uh, somebody sent me a message um, who we both know, but we'll leave that person anonymous. <laughs> message, um, he's not really going to run, is he? And I said, no, no way. <laughs> and then I, said, then I sent that person a message um, last night. Uh, I said, I reserve the right to change my mind about this. And then yeah. ten minutes later, I'll <laughs> well, that's that's kind of me because when 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 Lynn, I mean, the list that she gave me was was public information. It was nothing right. secretive. It was nothing, and these were just names that had been thrown around. And of course, we were just chatting. And um, and I said, oh, there's not a chance in Hades. Right. But the next day, again, it's just South Carolina. And I will tell you, I wouldn't be surprised if some other twist or turn didn't happen before the filing ended. So I, um, I was, you know, and I wasn't going to say, but. but now we have to, if Jenny Sanford could somehow run, it would be like... Well, it's a journalist dream. Now, it I will be... tell you, being an advocate for women in politics, you know, having any woman um, offer up, at my, in my understanding at this point of the folks that have offered up, there's not been one name um, of a woman um, that was, uh, you know, kind of in that top, Top tier. So, uh, but if uh, if Miss Sanford did, it would be it would certainly make it interesting. Wow. Yeah. I'll just leave that thought there. Yeah. And... <laughs> so uh, now uh, at, on Monday, uh, you know, the governor uh, she appointed uh, <coughs> excuse me she appointed Representative Scott to uh, ascend as senator, and she though, she though she hasn't made it official, seems to be a little doubt she's going to run for re-election. She removed herself from the consideration for uh, Senator Dement's seat pretty much right away. Uh, her polling came, so there's some polling that came out last week that showed her losing to uh, Vincent Shaheen in a hypothetical race, but that wasn't, I, it was, I think the sample size was only like 530 people. Uh, then there was a poll from Winthrop that came out a little bit earlier that said, uh, I think she was underwater by like 3%. Well, I read I read both those polls, and let me just tell you, I spent a little bit of time preparing in the event you'd ask me about this, and this is this is what I would tell you, because there's a primary, because Republicans do run primaries, Democrats don't traditionally. It's more of a coming together and anointment. Someone is selected, and so they have the advantage, the strategic advantage, so to speak, of running the full time with no one nibbling at them. But with Republicans, because we believe that competition raises the bar, we have these very serious primaries. And if you extricated all of the non-responses, I don't know, undecided, she actually is over 60% of people with favorables. Um, so in the primary, so again, this is just in the primary. So you could say this person over here is more middle of the ground, but the truth of the matter is you have to make it through the primary. And um, my assumption is unless someone more conservative came along, which and formidable in terms of money in their coffers because the governor has continued to raise money, it would be very, very difficult to win a primary. So with that being said, she'll probably come through the primary and then it's a 50-50 proposition if you again extricate all of what I call the ancillary numbers. So that's what the poll says and you know that's not really surprising in that we have a Democratic president right now who has you know yielded the benefits of win 
Um, and I also think that the economy, until you know, as it's turning around, and until people truly understand that the governor has been exceptionally successful in bringing economic development, particularly to these rural areas. Um, yeah. That until that happens, um, you know, it's all kind of stand to reason. So I think that she is a two-term governor. Yeah, I mean, she seems to have. Um, well, I was going to say weather the storm over yeah. the uh, hacking issue. Um, I mean, I know there's still people who aren't happy, and I, how can you? Your your private information has been exposed, but um, you know, she ha she held someone on her staff accountable. Um, she said that state quite frankly you know she could have been she was very forthcoming about what she thought she didn't do that maybe she could have uh, maybe not as quickly as some people would have liked but uh, the ironic part is if the economy improves too much right. the economy is good when people go to the polls in November 2014 they might forget who is responsible for that <laughs> I don't think she'll let them but uh, yeah, I, don't think, I think this. I think um, I think her legacy, and uh, she's been very um, very clear about putting her energy and effort behind us, beginning with the selection of Bobby Hitt as Commerce Secretary. But um, that is really her legacy. And so, as you see the numbers, I mean, you and I both know that today, for the first time, unemployment again went down in the state of South Carolina. Um, was tracked going in the, in the right direction, meaning it was going down. So what you're seeing is that this economic development is is really um, spurring, not in the traditional areas. I mean, you have uh, BMW in the upstate and Boeing in the lower part of the state, but you have Firestone that was brought to a rural area. You have little pockets of growth that are happening in you know non-traditional areas. And I think that when it's all said and done, um, if if uh, her campaign manager is as smart as I know he is, that that'll be really what they talk about. Sure, sure. Now, um, yesterday uh, she rolled out on uh, Thursday, excuse me, she rolled out her budget, and uh, while she was there, I had, a, I had a chance to ask her about her. She hadn't really spoken at length about um, uh, what happened in Newtown last week, and uh, she gave what I thought was a pretty. Um, it didn't seem. It didn't really feel like a political response. I think she responded as a mother and as a parent as much as she did a politician. Uh, I mean, when you first heard about what, ha what, was, what was happening in Newtown, I mean, well, just tell me what you thought. You know, it's interesting. Um, the Plating Group, the marketing firm um, that, uh, that I um, oversee, is predominantly women. We have some men, a handful of men that work here, but it's predominantly women. Most of us are mothers. And when it actually happened, we were all congregated in different pods, and there were even me. I mean, I, I'm pretty tough, but um, I I real I cried, and as the story started evolving, um, you know, I Friday night and um, Saturday, I was very weepy. I I just I could not imagine. I I still can't having a child go to school where they that's supposed to be the place that is sacrosanct, that is safe, and um, just saying goodbye to them and then and them not coming back. I cannot, and then the way that they told those parents, I mean, if you could mentally imagine standing there with 20 other parents and then the governor comes out and says, you know, I, I am here to inform you that your child will never come back. The expectation of seeing your child or being it next to a hospital bed and all of a sudden to know that your child's perished it is incomprehensible, and um, we, um, as a family, we uh, watch the um, the interdenominational uh, service. And uh, my kids were—I mean, they're 16, and I can tell you they had other places, people they wanted to 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 see, but um, they really didn't want to be there. But toward the end of it, I think one of my sons looked up at me, and he said. Uh, they were calling out the names and this whole family started crying. They called it one of the names. And he said um, something like, those people will never be the same mom. And I just thought, you know, out of the out of the mouth of babes. I mean, it changed those, those families, obviously that community, but it, it, it changed me. I mean, I can tell you. That town, I, I can't either. 
the town is always going to be always. Like Columbine, and it, unfortunately. That's exactly right. Yeah. And my kids were asking things like, Mom, would you make us go back to school after that happened? And I just yeah. said, you know, I, I honestly don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. And, um, you know, we're such advocates for for education that um, I just, it's completely beyond what I as a mom or um, really as a professional. And, and I prosecuted, so it's not like I'm... You know, I'm not used to seeing horrors of, of mankind. I have seen horrors of mankind. But children between the ages of 5 and 10, I cannot get my, just the, the, the magnitude of it. Um, I, I can't mean, really. That, you know, that, that, I mean, I've driven through that area and been through that area. And it's just like New England, small It's town. just like it's beautiful. It's like very. Dense and. That's like gone now, you know. That's that's gone. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine. I just can't imagine. And you know, um, then uh, it's interesting. But Ladonna Riggs, who's the managing editor of Palladium View, sent a question out, and it was about it was about what is what is the next step, so to speak, when it comes to multi-round um, arms. And it was fascinating because much like the governor. These women all responded, this is a comprehensive challenge, beginning with mental health issues. And guns, um, guns uh, need to be part of a robust discussion, but that's not necessarily the answer. And it was interesting to me just kind of the way the national politics played out, and yet women who are responding to this from across the United States seem to be pretty synergistic in terms of it's a big package problem. It's, you know, these, these um, and again, we have 16-year-old boys, and I'm not a hypocrite. I mean, they love knock them up, rock them up, sock them up, you know, video games. And right. The, the, right. the more you shoot, you know, the more guys you win. or And so it's part of our culture. And mm -hmm. to deny that is, is, again, almost hypocritical. So you've got this part of our culture that introduces these kids to things, and um, as a parent, you can you can absolutely stop some of it. But you know, the, the fact matters is much more complicated than what we than, than limiting weapons. Yeah, th this really seems like um, the turning point in the countries. I think it is too. How it just feels like that. I can't prove to any. I can't point to any fact, but it just feels like. The country is now going to say, "Okay, here's what we're putting in front of our kids. Here's what we're doing to people who are really need help, and they just need someone to talk to." And I feel isolated. I mean, you know, when you talk about the things that were in place, what, what we know, I mean, I'm sure more information is going to come out. When you talk about it as somebody, somebody who's clearly mentally ill, and Playing the and we, playing those video games where you shoot somebody on a screen and then you just hit reset and they're alive again. That's not reality. And a person no. with a person who's in that kind of state, you do that enough. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not a psychologist, but if you do that enough, you eventually maybe start to lose sense of what what, what the consequences of violence really are, and then you put. A weapon in that person's reach, literally and figuratively, and you wonder what happens. Yeah, and so I think I think that when the governor spoke, and I think it was in response to your question, that's really what she was saying. I mean, look at the mom. I mean, we all know um, we all know that you know life is fragile and all of those traditional things. What we don't expect is that when we send our children to school. No one expects them not to come back. They right. just don't. It's 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 a shattering moment. So I think it is. I think it is a change for our nation. And I think um, hopefully what will result is more defined um, mental health parameters for when people need treatment and finding treatment for them. And then culturally, how do you disengage some of the stuff that you know is right. so accessible to our kids? It is. So on a brighter note, um, yeah. let's look at the, real quick, look at the uh, 
it's, it, it's when you think about what's taking place in South Carolina <laughs> in this calendar year. Um, started with the primary, uh, which was crazy. Uh, had election ballot madness in the spring and through the summer. We had hundreds of people get thrown off, then about 150 more get put back on it with petitions. Then we had um, what I think is a major accomplishment with the victory of Katrina Sheely right. uh, in the House Senate. Uh, she defeated a longtime incumbent who, who and did it as a petition candidate. Um, just from everything I could tell, just in plain nose to the grindstone, hard work. And then yeah, we had election day, obviously, we had election day. And now, as we're coming to the, we, what we've talked about already, Jim DeMint, Tim Scott, Mark Sanford. So give, what's your takeaway from what, from what, your point of view of this year? I mean, what are you going to remember, I guess? The question is, what are you going to remember about 2012, right? Um, I think you did a great job of hitting every single one of the highlights, and I'm not going to be redundant. Um, our state is a state that you can never expect anything. It is, it, it's our mantra, expect the unexpected. Um, Kudos to now Senator Shealy. We had uh, we we had um, the picture of her when she was standing with her gavel in hand and um, sent it out everywhere, saying, "This is just a great moment for the state of South Carolina." And you said it. What was what was spectacular about it was this is a woman that ran and the was not successful and. Um, had the fortitude and really just the sheer tenacity and willpower to go a second time. That's that's tremendous and it's hard. I mean, I can tell you, I've I've been successful and I've lost, and the losses can take the take the wind out of your sails, you know. And uh, she was just incredibly able to to um, to move. Uh, the other thing is, and I don't think she's received enough play is. Um, Heather Amos Crawford um, out of Horry County. She's in the House of Representatives and young, delightful, attractive, um, someone that um, you know I've watched. She was a, a young Republican president of the crowd and president of a group and uh, her husband was very involved in politics. They married and then she ran and um, you know that's, that's a great uh, change for the state. And then we have a personal friend with Ann Wagner. Um, who we actually, the Palladium View. Palladium View is a national site. If you took a look at our pillars, we are not indigenous to the state of South Carolina. We really are women from across the United States. I think we have 39 states represented. And Ann Wagner was one of our national picks and she was successful. So the fact that she could be elected um, uh, from Missouri, I think, is pretty tremendous. So there were some women that did great things. Um, but from a kind of a looking back, I mean, you mentioned all of them. It was a crazy year. I think of that primary. I mean, no one, no one foresaw Speaker Gingrich winning that until the debate. And he just did such a great job of the debate. And so then Governor Romney becomes a Republican pick. Everyone jumps aboard and you know, we, we fell short. I read, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, I read a very interesting article from MIT. And the article basically um, says that it's an analysis of what happened with the Republicans and Democrats. And I'm just going to kind of shortcut. They said in this article, the Democrats ran the presidential primary the way you would run like a county race. Right. Whereas we did the old school, which was we did these broad brush, you know, lower taxes, less government. What they did was they went into the, they called it ward politics, which is like okay. county politics, and then turned people out based on very succinct. We do micro targeting in the Republican Party, but we've never done a national election drilling down to the level that was done for the Democrats. And so, you know, hopefully lessons learned and um, it's really fascinating what's going on with micro targeting. It's a hundred It is fascinating. So. It's a brand new world. Karen, we're gonna say thank you. And thank you. Best wishes to your family, you of course, to the folks uh, at the Palladian View. We appreciate everything you do and we always enjoy talking with you. Have a great holiday. Have a great Likewise. Christmas and New Year's.